Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I am Danielle, AKA Stitcherista here on YouTube. And today is going to be, and you are not seeing things. Today is going to be a diamond paint with me while I continue working on Treasure Studios Art Cherry Blossom by Lizzie Falcon. Yes, I pulled it back out. See, I filmed my diamond painting stash video this morning and it's still processing as of the recording of this video. And the last kit that I had in my stash was this one. And when I pulled it out, I said, why in the fuck have I not completed this kit yet? I mean, I only have this and then like two more rows. Like, why did I stop working on it? I think I just got burnt out on the colors. So it's been a nice break to work on Sweet Tooth, but now I'm going to go on this until I finish it. Yes, ma'am. So we are going to be seeing this for the next, it's probably gonna take me, I don't know how long it's gonna take me. But before I get into chatting, because we got some chatting to do, and the true crime story for today, I am gonna show you how I hang up diamond paintings in my closet. Um, one or two people asked to see it and I forgot to include it in the diamond painting stash video, which was what I was going to do originally. So I'm going to pause the video and then I'm going to take you into my office and I will show you. Okay, I literally just use like a pants hanger that I bought a pair of pants from Walmart or something and got this. All I do is I will clip all, th I have three canvases here and it's kind of heavy. So you have to gauge how you, how many you can fit on a hanger without them slipping off. But I literally just take this, we are going into my office now. I literally just take this and I'm gonna hang them. Oh! and they all just fell off the hanger because I lifted it up. Let me pause for a second. Okay, I don't know why the lighting is so yellow on this, but you can see I have it hung here in the closet, just hung up like I'm hanging, let me back up, like I'm hanging like a sweater. That's it. Um, again, be very, very careful how many you put on a hanger only because they will fall. You saw them just fall. They fell twice. So I wouldn't put any more on there. No, ma'am. So I'm going to pause again, get you guys back in the tripod, and we will sit down and have a chat. Okay, and I'm really surprised that I... Uh, Oh, I just realized why it was yellow down in there. Because I had the autofocus off. If it would have autofocused, it would have brightened up probably. Oh well, you get the point, right? So, today is Friday, July 16th. Today is my five year YouTube anniversary. Yay! Let's go, right? So I do have a new member to the channel, Carol G. Carol, thank you so very much for joining the channel. And I did have some coffee bought for me yesterday. Gina bought me three coffees and says, hey Danielle, congrats on your five year YouTube anniversary. So glad I found your channel, enjoy your weekend. I love my husband, but would like for him to go away for a weekend too. <laughs> I laughed at that, she had me laughing because yes, I love my husband, but it is nice when he does his trips or I go to my retreats and you just have time to yourself. Uh, so, and then I had Edna Clinton, who has been a very generous subscriber over the years. She sent me $50 by PayPal yesterday. She said she tried to do it through buy me a coffee, but she couldn't get it to work. So she just sent $50 to my PayPal account. Thank you so very much, Edna. Very, very, much appreciated. Okay, so let's see what color. 
I think I was working on black. Yeah, the heart is black, if I remember. So let's just do that. Oh, I need some sticky stuff. So yesterday, Bill left. I was off work. And I'm off work today. Yes, no job came in. So I am not upset by that. Our job for Monday confirmed. So we're right back to it on Monday. But um, I filmed 3,467 videos on my channel yesterday. Yeah, I did quite a bit. I did probably seven, eight. I mean, I did a lot. I did a whole lot and I was exhausted last night once I got in bed. So, um, but thank you to everyone who watched and commented and all of that. It was nice to do those videos again, you know? Okay. So Bill left about, I want to say... Four o'clock yesterday for his fishing trip. And I was doing videos and stuff in my office all the way up until eight o'clock. I didn't even eat dinner until eight o'clock. So last night for dinner, I had some of the chicken tiki marsala that I get from Costco. It was very good. And I was going to work on my cross stitch project. I was just so tired. I didn't do any stitching. I wound up, now I went on Hulu yesterday because I literally was going to stitch. So, wait a minute, my chair keeps hitting the table. Okay. So I go on Hulu and if you have a Hulu subscription, when you go into Hulu, why did that come off on the tray? Are you fucking kidding me right now? Just stay on there. I don't want it to come up when I lift up the tray. Oy. Anyway. <laughs> I go on Hulu and they always put like their newest shows in the banner. And so when I click on Hulu and it opens up, I see spinoff of American Horror Story. It's called American Horror Stories. And I'm like, get the F out of here. Like, are you kidding me right now? So, um, yeah, it's a spinoff of the show, of the original American Horror Story, written by the same people. And... I watched, there's only two episodes that dropped yesterday. I watched the first one, loved it. Going to watch the second one today or tonight. I debated whether to watch it because, remember, Bill's not home. So I get kind of like freaked out. I hear every little creak and crack, but I was good. I was good. So I watched that and then I went up to bed. So when Bill's not here, when he, you know, goes on these trips... I sleep in his bed because his room is upstairs closest to the door in the house. And I just feel better, you know, mentally just being up here than being shut down in my bedroom. So I brought my laptop and my iPad and he has a smart TV like I do. So I was able to sign in through my YouTube and I was watching YouTube and I... Yeah, I was just on the computer looking at Facebook groups and stitching stuff. And I read a little bit of my book. Oh my God, the book is so good. B.A. Paris, The Therapist. Yes, love it. I'm definitely going to read today. When I'm done this video, this is the last video I have to record today. When I'm done, I'm going to go downstairs, get a cup of coffee, read. I might even take a nap because I was up at like 6.30 this morning and I don't sleep well when Bill's not here. So, yeah. I'm a little tired. So, you know, normally, normal course of a day, I get up and I do my hair and makeup and get dressed and all of that stuff every single day. 
Um, I personally like to look the best that I can for Bill, unless I'm sick or, you know, we're doing like heavy housework or something. I will. I, I get up and put on decent clothes and hair, makeup, all that. So I woke up today and I was like, oh, I need to take a shower. And, and then I'm thinking, no, I don't. <laughs> I said, you know what? I'm going to give myself a break today. Right now I am in comfy clothes. I just brushed my hair and put it back in a scrunchie. No makeup. I washed my face, brushed my teeth, put moisturizer on. I'm not going anywhere. I actually have sushi coming through DoorDash. I'm going to treat myself to that today. And I'm going to enjoy today without having, you know, hair, makeup, all that stuff. Yeah. Like I said, I'm not going anywhere. Now, I didn't have to do laundry either. I will do laundry tomorrow because he's coming home tomorrow night and he'll have laundry. And I have to make his tea. But yeah, I didn't have to do laundry today. I did have to do preparation for Monday's job for work, but I've already done that. I already did our banking. <sighs> yeah, I'm enjoying today. I'm thankful for today. Now, when he comes back, because there's two episodes of Big Brother that we haven't seen, we'll watch those probably Sunday. But I got up this morning and I did the grocery order for Sunday. And read some of my book, had a cup of coffee. The book is so good. I'm, I'm guessing it's just going to keep getting good. And, you know, you suspect like everybody. Like, I read enough books that when I'm reading about the main character's husband, he's giving me kind of the heebie-jeebies. Like, something's off with the guy. I don't know what it is, but something's off there. So, we will see. We will see. But yeah, something strange happened today. So remember I ordered Cruella from Treasure Studios Art. A couple days ago, I got notification that it shipped. Awesome, because it's been less than a month. So great. So when I wake up this morning, it's early. I mean, it's like 7.30, 8 o'clock when I was on my computer. I get an email that says your order was delivered. I'm like, really? Because I didn't hear my ring doorbell go off. So I'm like, okay, I go downstairs. I open the door. I look. I don't see anything. And I'm like, I need to check the email. So when I look at the email and I click on the tracking, you're going to love this. It says it was delivered to Toronto, Canada. What? <laughs> I'm like, well, I don't live in Canada. And I even looked at like the order. It has my address. So I emailed them and I'm waiting for a response back. What I think might have happened is whoever inputs the tracking numbers in people's orders, maybe they put the wrong tracking number in my order. Do you know what I mean? I'm thinking that might be it because how else would you get that completely confused? None of that even makes any sense. None of it makes sense. So, and it said, yeah, it was delivered to a recipient. I'm like, well, somebody got Cruella diamond painting kit. Or like I said, if the, if the tracking number was put on my order by mistake, who knows what that person ordered. So I'm really hoping that they get back to me today. So I'm dying to get that kit. And I was like, what the fuck? Toronto, Canada? I don't live in Canada. I'm like, okay, no, no. So, yeah, that was interesting. But that's all that's really going on today. Like I said, the videos I recorded today, which are going to be up before this video is my scrapbook cross-stitch finishes, which is a pretty short video. The diamond painting stash one is a little over an hour because I took each canvas out of its box. Boy, was that, whoo. It was neat to go through there, though, and see what I really have. And then this video. So that's really only the only backlog I have. I just wanted to take advantage of the time I had yesterday to record all of those videos and get them up there. And yeah. So let's get into today's true crime story. So this is an old one. Remember I said the next one wasn't old, but when I, I glanced at it, 
and it was about a child and I'm not going to read that on my channel if I can possibly help it. I was like, no. So the next one's an old one. Yay. I like the old ones. Okay. This one is Mary Piercy. So the case of Jack the Ripper, arguably the most famous in the annals of serial murder has thrown up many bizarre suspects over the years. Prince Albert Victor, Arthur Lewis Carroll, and renowned painter Walter Sickert have all been mentioned as potential rippers. What the actual fuck right now? I was trying to have my iPad on the other side, but obviously that's not working. Okay. Jesus. <laughs> I need to eat something. Like, I'm hangry right now. Okay. So... Another theory widely disregarded by serious students of the case is that the Ripper was actually a woman. Really? Okay. This idea was first postulated by Inspector Frederick Aberline, lead investigator on the Whitechapel case, although Frederick later distanced, distanced himself from the notion. So, is it possible? Could Jack possibly have been a Jill? I like that play on words there. And if so, who is likely to have been the woman responsible? So one name that is often mentioned is that of Mary Piercy, a kept woman who was executed in 1890 for killing her lover's wife and baby. Oh, shit. And it is easy to see why these particular crimes would attract attention. The murders were as bloody as those committed by Jack himself. Ooh, so this is going to be... Buckle up, peeps. This is going to be a, a gruesome one, I feel like. So, Mary Piercy was born Mary Eleanor Wheeler in 1866. Very little is known about her childhood, although she appears to have grown into a precocious teenager who, although not conventionally pretty, had no difficulty in attracting men. Personality. One of those was a carpenter by the name of John Piercy, who became involved with Mary when she was in her late teens. Although the two were never married, Mary adopted his name. Okay, I was wondering, I'm like, okay, well, they must have gotten married. No, no. There's like a little piece of a diamond here. I want to get it off of there. Get off of there. Okay, I'm going to be able to cover that up with a diamond. Bye. Okay. He later abandoned her, citing repeated infidelity. Huh, Mary been messing around. Okay. Barely missing a beat, Mary took up with another lover, a wealthy trader known as Charles Creighton. He set her up in rented rooms at 2 Priory Street, Kentish Town in North London, and he also paid her a stipend. His only requirement was that she make herself available to him during his weekly visits. All righty. Make yourself available, Mary. This was an era in which young women worked primarily at manual labor, if indeed they worked at all. Mary was thus placed in a privileged position, her time mainly her own. But the hours were lonely, especially to a girl like Mary who had a history of depression. Mary, you need to find a hobby, girl. Like, reading? I mean, I know diamond painting wasn't out then, but sewing? Something. She began frequenting the local taverns, drinking heavily and picking up men. Oi, no. One of those she attracted was a furniture remover by the name of Frank Samuel Hogg. Okay. Frank ran a relatively successful business and even had printed business cards, something that greatly impressed Mary. Soon he was paying regular visits to her rooms, usually late at night when there was no one around to note his arrival and spread vicious rumors. Mary did not want to lose her wealthy sponsor. Yep, I get that. A system was developed whereby Mary would place a light in her window when it was safe to approach. Over time, she even gave Frank his own key. Oh boy. But Frank and Mary were not exclusive. He had at least one other lover, a 31-year-old seamstress named Phoebe. When Frank became pregnant, Mary urged Frank to do the right thing and marry her. 
Perhaps her intention was to seem magnanimous, her hope that Frank would reject the idea and declare his undying love for her, but to her dismay, Frank dis took her at her word. He married Phoebe in November of 1888, and their daughter, also named Phoebe, was born in the summer of 1889. Frank's marriage, however, did not spell the end of his relationship with Mary. Because everyone fucks around. Like, nobody can be, fi nobody can be monogamous. Like, my God, marriage vows here, people. He continued to call on her, although their trysts were now curtailed, with Frank often having to hurry home to his wife. It is easy to see how this might have affected Mary. Here she was, the plaything of a wealthy man, a kept woman. Meanwhile, Phoebe had everything Mary wanted, a family and a husband who incidentally was the man Mary loved, so she didn't love this other guy. Mary must have stewed on this a long time, and eventually she decided to take action. Oi, goi, goi. On the morning of October 20th, 1890, Mary paid a local lad named Willie Holmes a penny to deliver a note to Phoebe. A penny. Can you imagine paying someone a penny to deliver a letter for you? The letter was an invitation to tea, which Phoebe gladly accepted, arriving just before four, pushing her baby in a stroller. A short while later, Charlotte Prittington. All these names sound like these women are prissy and snobby and right. So a short while later, Charlotte Prittington, Mary's neighbor, heard the sound of glass breaking from next door. Concerned that Mary may have taken a fall and hurt herself, she called over the fence to check on her neighbor but got no reply. After dark that evening, another neighbor saw Mary leaving her residence pushing a baby stroller, which appeared to contain some bulky object. Oh, God. Later that night, a bobby walking his beat. What the hell is a bobby? We're going to find out. A bobby is a police officer. Okay. Okay. So, a police officer walking his beat on nearby Crossfield Road made a horrific discovery. The woman was lying on the sidewalk, a gray cardigan wrapped around her head. When the policeman removed this, he saw immediately the horrendous injury she had suffered. So, a pathologist would later describe these in detail. The deceased had sustained a skull fracture due to being hit over the head by a heavy but narrow object, perhaps a fire poker. Her throat had been slashed, the wound running so deep that it all but decapitated her. Jesus Christ, okay? Cuts to the hands and arms suggested that she had tried to ward off her attacker, while the lack of blood at the spot where she was found indicated that the murder had taken place elsewhere. The savage slaying coming so close on the heels of the White Chapel murder sent a wave of panic through the area. Many believed that Jack the Ripper was back. The police, of course, drew no such conclusion. Their priority was to identify the victim, a difficult task in an era when few carried identification. Perhaps some clue could be derived from a blood-stained baby stroller, which had been discovered about a mile from the crime scene. And my mail is here. Yay. Detectives were still contemplating that puzzle when the body of a baby was found. Oh, no. No, 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 no. The child appeared to have been suffocated, and the police soon linked the two cases. They believed that the stroller had been used to transport the corpse of the adult victim. And how was that happening? Did they cut the body up? Because how are you fitting an adult into a baby stroller? Just saying. In doing so, the killer had placed the adult on top of the child, causing the infant to suffocate. What the fuck? What? Ooh, I think I got my needlework kit in the mail. What is that? Boy, I'm getting all kinds of boxes today. Okay, I don't know what that is. Um, they believed that the stroller had been used to transport the corpse. Okay, yeah, it was a savage double murder, and the police were determined to bring the perpetrator to justice, right? By the following morning, Frank was frantic about his missing wife and baby. He went with his sister Clara to the police station and reported her disappearance. Stopping off at Mary's rooms on the way home, he sent Clara up to find out if Mary had seen Phoebe. 
Mary said that she hadn't, but offered to accompany Clara to the morgue to make inquiries. There, Mary's behavior would arouse suspicion. When Phoebe's corpse was wheeled out, she became hysterical, first denying that it was Phoebe and then rushing from the room, and it was Clara who confirmed that this was indeed her sister-in-law. With the identity of the victim verified, the police turned their attention to the most likely suspect, the husband. We know this! The spouse is always the first suspect. Fortunately for Frank, he had an alibi for the time of the murder. That did not prevent the police from probing, however, and they soon coaxed Frank into an admission of his affair with Mary. That equaled motive, and if Frank hadn't committed the murder, then that elevated his mistress to the top of the list. Evidence was soon obtained to support this belief. First, the neighbor who had seen Mary pushing the stroller along Priory Street came forward to inform the police. Then a search of Mary's home found blood spatters in the kitchen and a bloodied carving knife, hatchet, and poker. Jesus, okay. There were also clear signs of a struggle, broken window panes in the kitchen, and a bloodstained rug that had recently been cleaned with paraffin. Additionally, there were bloodstains on Mary's clothes, and although unmarried, she was wearing a wedding ring. This was later identified as belonging to Phoebe. Oh, no. No, she did not. Mary was arrested and taken to Marlbone Police Station. There she continued to protest her innocence. Asked about the blood in her apartment, she said that she had killed some mice. Uh-huh. When the interrogators persisted with that line of questioning, she began chanting over and over, killing mice, killing mice, killing mice. Wackadoo. It seemed a foolhardy approach for one facing a penalty of death if found guilty, but Mary would never admit her guilt not even in the moments before the trap door opened up beneath her feet. So her ass will be hanged. Mary Piercy was tried at the Central Criminal Court of the Old Bailey before Mr. Justice Denman on December 1st, 1890. The trial lasted three days, concluding on December 4th when the jury took just 52 minutes to find Mary guilty as charged. Judge Denman then asked if she had anything to say before he passed sentence, to which Mary responded, I say I am innocent of this charge. The judge then donned the black cap and sentenced her to hang. And in those days, there were no appeals. However, Mary's solicitor petitioned for her sentence to be commuted on medical grounds since Mary suffered from epilepsy and might have been in a fugue state when she committed the murders. This appeal was rejected by the Home Secretary, meaning that Mary's last hope was done. She was going to the gallows. So the execution date was set for Tuesday, December 23rd, 1890, three weeks after sentence was passed in accordance with the prevailing law. Once it was clear that she would not escape her fate, Mary appeared to accept it with a calm resolve that astounded her jailers. I mean, if you know you're going to be put to death, you know, I don't know. Her only request was that Frank should visit her on the Monday before her execution. Permission was granted, but Frank failed the show, leaving Mary deeply distressed. She wept bitterly in her cell that evening, but had regained her composure by the time the executioner, James Barry, arrived the next morning. So the conversation that passed between the executioner and Mary was poignantly genteel. He said, if you are ready, madam, I shall get these straps around you. At least he wasn't brutal with her, right? I am quite ready, Mr. Barry, Mary responded, and moments later she was walked the short distance to the gallows and positioned on the trap door. She kissed her two female warders goodbye, coaxing tears from one of them. Then the hood was fitted and the noose slipped over her head, and moments later the trap was sprung and Mary plunged to her death. So... One mystery, though, remains to be resolved about the case. So on the eve of Mary's execution, Mary asked her solicitor to place a classified ad in a Spanish newspaper. It read, M-E-C-P, last wish of M-E-W, have not betrayed. Mary refused to disclose the meaning of this cryptic message, leading to much speculation in later years. One common explanation is that someone else, perhaps another of Mary's lovers, had committed the murders and then fled to Spain. The message was to assure him that she had not revealed his identity to the police, 
And if that interpretation is correct, then Mary, vilified in some quarters as Jill the Ripper, was not even a murderer. Strange. That was a strange, strange story. But brutal that a mother and her daughter had to die, right? But yeah, they didn't play in those days. They hung. They hung people. And people usually gathered to watch. Like, it was quite the spectacle. Yeah. So, I am also going to do my nails today. I can see some growth out of here. It's been about two weeks, so... I'm going to do my nails today. I've already picked them out. I picked out something bright and glittery, so can't wait to do that. So we always end on a positive affirmation from A Year of Positive Thinking by Cindy Spiegel. And I think I'm going to have an apple and some peanut butter, too. I'm definitely hungry. Okay, so today is Friday, July 16th. And today's affirmation is titled, The World Needs Your Uniqueness. Be exactly who you are. The things that make you different are what also make you incredible. The world does not need more people to think and act like everyone else. A fucking men. Like, absolutely. Ideas, acceptance, and the depth of true inner beauty are all born from uniqueness. Hone the confidence that you need to stand out from others, and every day you will become more of who you genuinely are. That is probably my favorite affirmation that I have read in this entire book. So yeah, absolutely. You need to be who you are and embrace it, no matter how long it takes you to get there. Um, here recently, I would say in the past couple of months, I have truly begun to embrace many things about myself that are different than most people that I see in social circles. Um, not ashamed of it, you know, be too much, be who you are, never apologize for who you are. Yeah, I stopped doing that too. So, um, but remember for the foreseeable future, I'm going to be doing videos on the weekend now, um, true crime stories. So I will see you guys tomorrow in my next video. So have a great Friday. And as always, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments section below and I will answer them to the best of my ability. Thank you so much for watching and subscribing, and I will see you in my next video. Bye, guys.